So today is going to be partially sharing some things and thinking about things, but we're also going to be uh, doing some uh, group participation where you're going to have some opportunity to collaborate in a Google Doc, an, e an editable Google Doc, and then go to some break breakout rooms and talk. So we're looking forward to that. I sent that Google Doc link yesterday, and if you haven't had a chance to look at it, it's not a big deal. Just wanted to send it out there in case people wanted to take a look. So it, it is. So it, should I put it in the chat right now? That would be great. Yes. Okay, that will do. Be, thank you so much. So it is great to see you today. I want to go over the agenda with you briefly. Uh, I just want to basically touch on what authentic assessment is. A lot of you probably have heard of authentic assessment before. For those of you who haven't, I'm just gonna talk about it briefly because I wanna spend more time talking about the technology and thinking about what authentic assessment does look like in the online environment. So then we're going to talk about some uh, tips for nailing down some assessment specifics. And then, then we will get into our group where we share some best practices and problem solve together. And a lot of times, some of this is really uh, discipline specific because certain disciplines have certain guidelines and SLOs that have to be met that may be a little bit unique depending on which uh, department you're in. All right, so I wanted to just quickly talk about authentic assessment. And the idea around authentic assessment is really kind of this idea of, I, I think about it as apprenticeship. You know, a couple hundred years ago, the way people learned how to do what they were doing was that they would apprentice with uh, a master tradesman of some sort or something, whether it, even the aristocrats had their own training. And so the idea of authentic assessment is that you're requiring the students to do something that demonstrates knowledge and skills. It fosters really active learning as opposed to just passive learning, you know, where you're pouring in the information that students have to memorize and then produce in a quiz or an exam. It requires students to contextualize and apply what they have learned. And this is really important because so much of the brain-based uh, research is about the idea of what, how does somebody learn and people really learn within context. So they bring what they have to the classroom and if you're able to tap into what it is they already know and then add a little bit of something new that they can practice with, that's how they're really going to do the deep learning. Uh, it also uh, achieves deep, which I just talked about, it, it achieves deep learning which is actually a way to help transform what students are doing. I remember when I was younger, uh, I took these English classes and they were the honors and AP English classes. And one of the things that they did was they did the vocabulary tests. And I was super proud of myself because I could literally, I had, I had English right after lunch. I could literally at the last 20 minutes of lunch, look at the list, memorize the words, take the quiz, get a hundred, and move on with my life. I didn't remember the vocabulary, which was really sad. I, you know, I was young, I was trying to figure out a way to you know, get this done because I didn't appreciate it. And so that's the type of thing that we're trying to avoid with authentic assessment. And then it, again, which connects with everything else here, it inspires students to make connections between the course content and the real world. And right now, what's a silver lining about the pandemic and everything online is that we really have this really rich opportunity to give students uh, chances to make these connections within our courses. And um, Karen was talking about the fact that she teaches the history of photography. And it would be interesting to, for me to see the difference of how they might have photographed the pandemic of 1920, the, the Spanish flu and now, right? A compare and contrast of those photos, for example. So that would be maybe an, an example of authentic assessment. Um, and then just to quickly look at low impact assessment, which requires students to respond to question and demonstrate knowledge and skills. That again, like I said, take that quiz really quickly. It fosters passive learning where students are just trying to figure out what they have to do to pass the class. And as well as 
the lack of contextualization. So we're trying to really avoid this low impact assessment. And it doesn't mean that you never give a quiz. I have quizzes that I give. It never means that you don't have exams. It just means uh, an encouragement to try and figure out how you can rethink about assessment so that it's meaningful for the students, it's meaningful for you, and it really goes to the core of students really wanting to learn as opposed to perhaps cheat the system. Lynn, would you like to add anything to this? Uh, I have to say that um, I agree. <laughs> Authentic assessment is also more um, exciting for students. It gives them something to do that allows them to be creative and um, in, in a lot of ways and um, uh, will engage with your course a little bit more instead of trying to figure out ways to work around your um your quiz or your test if that makes sense all right thank you all right so we're going to move on here to some additional you know what, janet just fyi i don't have the link to this presentation usually we put that in the chat but okay, let I... me do that for you i'm gonna i'm sorry everybody no, that's okay i want to make sure that you can see it there's a lot of text on these slides and it may be difficult to see in the zoom we generally like to share it with you in the chat so that you can open it in a separate window and follow along that absolutely. way absolutely and look you're right there lynn so hmm how come i can't find it well i just i sorry. think i sent it to you i'm hoping i will figure it out go ahead janet okay can keep right. going I apologize that's okay that's all right I'm I okay all right so some additional benefits again it's reducing this ease of finding the right answer as opposed to using the material to create something it reduces the tendency of cramming the night before the exam or in my case 20 minutes before the exam it provides opportunity for non-disposable assignments. And so the question, and, and one of the things I often share with students on the first day of school, but I don't know if they exactly understand this, but I do not give busy work. Even though my classes have a lot of things for students to do, that's always my big problem is I have to narrow it down. The one thing that is really important to me as a teacher is not to have those disposable assignments that don't mean anything for students. Um, and then it, again, it in, in introduces a variety and it includes opportunity to support. And I also, the one thing I wanted to really hit home is so many times when I offer authentic learning projects for my students, what ends up happening is that there are students who go well above and beyond in their projects and they're so happy and proud to not just share it with me but share it with our learning community and when i ask them can i share this with others they're always very um, proud that i've asked it's something that they're going to carry with them all right so the steps to creating authentic assessment is really a lot about backwards planning, which we've talked about before in other sessions, so I'm not bringing it in here. It's your identi identifying the learning objectives. So you're looking at your SLOs and what are you trying to measure with this assignment? It's selecting an authentic task. What will the students do to demonstrate the objectives? And I have to tell you in this particular space with the authentic task, I have, friends that I meet with regularly and sometimes they'll text and say, hey, can you talk with me about XYZ assignment? And then we talk about it. And not only if it's my idea, my assignment gets better. If it's my friend's idea, I get ideas about how I can actually <laughs> create an assignment similar to, similarly to that. And it's really a wonderful way to um, come up with a lot of creative things to do. So if you have some friends that you regularly brainstorm with, I think that's a good idea because a lot of times if we are regularly um, just used to these exams and quizzes, it's hard to get those creative juices flowing. And once you uh, select that 
authentic task. You identify the criteria, like what you're going to look for, kind of teasing out those SLOs. What are you looking at? What are you wanting to see from that? And then creating a rubric. And once that is all created and you know what it is that they need to do, then you can backwards plan. So you have the project and you can go backwards and think about what it is they need to do to actually get to that project. So at this point right now, I actually wanted to speak about other aspects of assessment. So we're talking about effective and equitable assessment. We spoke a little bit about authentic assessment, but I would like to talk a little bit more about policies and procedures and types of things you can think about doing that are assessment related when it comes to technology. So I'm going to open up this handout, nailing down some specifics about assessment. And I'm going to talk about a few of these. So this is linked in the uh, document here. And there's lots of links that you can follow. And so when we're talking about equity in assessment, so we spent a little bit of time about authentic assessment, let's talk about equity in assessment. And so the whole idea about equity as a review is that equity is taking down the barriers that stop students from learning and also showing you what it is they need to do. So one of the things that Lynn talked with me about way back in January, and this was before the pandemic, and it really had nothing to do with online, but I've used it in my online class since, is that with her students, she put, uh, came up with a weekly checklist for students so that they could know what it is that they needed to do for the week. And Lynn, one of the things I remember her talking about is that she did this for her hybrid class, which was part face-to-face -face and part online. And students had a really hard time knowing what they had to accomplish but because the cognitive overload of understanding, okay, this is the class, this is online, blah, blah, what am I doing? So she came up with this weekly checklist and I took her weekly checklist idea and I used it with my English 102 online after the pandemic started because I always have a unit with all these different assignments, but I really wanted to break it down even further and take away the barriers that stop them from understanding what they needed to accomplish that week. So they have the checklist and then they are able to, they know what the assignment is. And what's wonderful about the checklist, I did not open this up, but I will open it up, that Lynn did that I especially appreciate, and I think that it's extremely helpful for uh, students, is not only does she have this checklist that she's doing with the assignments, she includes the approximate estimate, estimated time. Because with the types of assignments I assign, they're all different lengths of time. So sometimes my assignments might be 30 minutes. Sometimes they may be 10 or 45 or even longer. And you know, when I'm talking about writing projects, I might put down for a draft, maybe two to four hours for a first draft. So I really like that this estimate is here and that's helpful for students. And she included, I will do this on the same time. I've completed it here. And what I ended up doing is I color coded mine. This is just a sample for the orientation and it's still opening here in Zoom. But I do, I do colors. So each day has a color and that also helps students know, okay, this has to be done by this day versus this day. Uh, Lynn, did you want to add anything about the checklist that you use and why it's important? Um, you covered it. Uh, the students really liked it. We did it in a paper version in the hybrid class, but you could do it totally in a um, distance learning class. Many times the students just um, printed it out once we went online and took a picture of it and sent it back. I gave them... Um, I don't know, I think it was something like five points a week for each one when my um, grading scale was 100, which, you know, we're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes too. Uh, so it's very low stakes, but they get credit for doing it. And what they told me was that they really appreciated some tangible thing that they could use to keep them on track. So yeah, it was real helpful. 
Yes. And Janet's adaptations are, are really good too. This, this is what I do for my online class. So whether we go back or we don't go back, I'm going to be using this particular version um, just because I thought it was, it's so helpful. It helps students know what it is that they need to do. So thank you, Lynn. And that's again, because I spoke with Lynn about this, I'm always getting ideas. And I, I bolded some of the ones I'm going to talk about. Um, the other thing that, um, that the liberal arts division in particular, but at the school at large is doing right now, is looking at this book called Grading for Equity. And one of the things that it talks about in this particular book about is about how the zero to 100 scale is not exactly equitable because what ends up happening is that if you give a student an assignment and it's worth 10 points, okay, they turn it in, they get the full 10 points. Like there's nothing wrong with it. You're not, you know, taking any part off. But if you give them another assignment worth 10 points and they don't do it, that's a zero. So we average those two assignments together and what they, what they get from that is they, out of 20 points, they have 10 points. So the average of those two assignments is an F. And in fact, it takes, I think, like four assignments to actually get up to the grade of C. And this idea about grades is that students already are um, culturally taught about how important grades are. And even if we try to say we care more about your learning than we do about grades, and I think that's an important message that we bring forward, students are already taught by our culture that grades are so important that missing a single assignment could result in a student actually quitting your class or leaving. And a lot of times, maybe this assignment, it's important, but it's not important enough that they should have to, for every single assignment that they miss, that they have to actually dig themselves so deeply out of a hole. So there's a couple of things that I am experimenting with doing. One is this summer semester, I gave 40% to students who didn't turn in their assignments, which is still an F, but if they have a 40%, so let's say the 10 points, it's a four points plus 10 points, that if they miss one out of two assignments, that brings them up to a lower C. Another way to think about it as well as the grade point average, that's actually a lot more equitable mathematically, that the zero is an F, one is a D, two is a C, three is a B, and four is an A. So I'm thinking about actually moving and changing and having assignments be due in, in parts of four, so four, eight, 12, 16, based on how important the assignment is. So I'm not gonna talk any longer about that, but I just wanted to share with you that we have been so indoctrinated about the zero to 100% scale, which is, again, really tends to set a, a barrier against the learning. And I have a longer aspect here. I just want to add to that really quickly. Um, we want to be evaluating the work that our students are actually doing and turning in. And if they are have things that they're not turning in and um, I mean there needs to be a balance right so right. we can't necessarily say I'm only going to evaluate the things they turn in and they turn in half of your assignments and therefore they they didn't get enough of the um, higher stakes formative um, um, and summative assessments those are the most important ones uh, obviously you don't want to pass a student like that, but a student who has consistently done your work, but not turned in a few things, lower stakes assignments, and that's lowering their grade, it is definitely not fair. So there, there's got to be a way to do it. These are a couple of methods to make that happen. Right. And so another, and again, this is, this is what I'm doing. It doesn't mean that it has to be what you're doing, but what we're encouraging you to think about today is what you're doing and why, and is it creating unnecessary barriers to students learning and showcasing what they've learned. I think that's at the center of what it is we're trying to discuss today. So in that vein, 
thinking about what your late policy is. And so I'm not gonna share with you my late policy, although you can click on it and take a look at my late policy. And we're gonna have an opportunity if you guys wanna discuss that. This is like, the, for me, the hot topic is the late policy for my 27 years of teaching, trying to figure out the best sort of late policy for my English class, which might be different if you're doing some other uh, discipline. But thinking about a late policy that both encourages community college students to be responsible and on time, while at the same time being reasonable to the fact that our student body tend to have jobs, have other responsibilities, et cetera, especially during this pandemic time where they have to take a job if they've gotten it. And so what are you going to do in that particular situation? Lynn, did you want to add anything to that? Nope, that sounds good. Okay, and so um, if you assign several low stakes assignments like I am guilty, I actually consider uh, what I do in Canvas is I drop a few with the lowest score. And in my last presentation about assessment, I actually included uh, how to do that in a little video tutorial. So I will add that actually to our announcement next week so you can see that. It's a rule that I added in my grades for a particular type of grade where I actually draw, I drop six of the lowest assignments because I have a number of them that I do, a lot of scaffolding in my class. That way students who have a hiccup or two um, don't have to worry about it, but you also don't have to worry about trying to gauge what's fair or not. It's the same thing for everybody in the class. We've talked about this in our sessions many, many times about creating a simple, repeatable format that's predictable and easy to follow for students. And we're talking about modules in this case. And so um, one thing you can do, there's two things, modules and assignments and I've been doing this quite a bit, is that I create the optimal assignment. And then when I go to create the next one that's similar to it, maybe about a different text or a different uh, part of writing, I just duplicate that assignment in my gradebook and then revise it so I don't have to reinvent the wheel because we want to make sure that what we're giving to students is predictable and easy to follow. So instead of trying to figure out what you're trying to assign them, you're spending more time on trying to uh, teach them the material. Also, your modules could, could follow a pre predictable pattern. So I have a couple of examples. So you could have something where you have a weekly uh, attendance check-in, weekly overview, the readings for the week, the introduction and practice, collaboration with peers, end of the week of assessment, and then a little page about what's coming up. And if students know that this is the drill for your class online, they know what to look for and what it is that they're doing. Another uh, simple, th this is one sample here, and I have a sample here for synchronous online classes. This one was from Daya Mudra from online from Twitter. Um, this is an, a sample for synchronous online classes. You could have students attend if you're doing that, read, watch, discuss, and practice, and that could be the format potentially. Now, again, these are just samples, so it's not like you have to take the sample and, and not change it or revise it. These are just samples that you can use if you think that they're valuable and you can add it and edit as needed. Another aspect of online specific assessment, and this is something that I was talking with Lynn about that I am trying to get better with, is that I have created a lot of wonderful, I'm saying wonderful, so a lot of materials that I hope students think are wonderful that are lecture materials, okay? So what do you do with a lecture? And so I have started to uh, create several guided note-taking uh, practices so that I have my video or my voice thread or whatever it is I'm using and I watch, I I've created it and then I go back and I watch it and I add some, some guided notes. 
So this is a I, great idea. The, and, and this way you have them take the guided notes, turn them in for low stakes, but really what you're having them do is take the notes for themselves because they're going to need it. But it's a low stakes assignment. It's a way to do it online. It sort of takes over, you know, when you're in class and you're lecturing and you're saying, okay, make sure you take out your notebooks and take notes. This is the way that you're having them do it. And so I have questions. I, I put it together in a table. I like the table format because there's a space that they can type in and it makes it bigger or smaller, but it's all with the, the questions here. So this was a synthesis lecture. And so I'm asking them about synthesis here. And every single time I, I create a guided notes, I do the same thing as I do in, uh, in um, uh, Canvas. I go up here, I make a copy and I duplicate it and I change it because I'm always including first, this is how you make a copy of it and the directions, please watch the lecture and then also fill out the notes and I'll change the picture. So that's what I do and I find that students find it to be helpful and it reminds them that yes, the actual um, lectures are important and not to be missed. Um, I believe it was Rena in one of our sessions during the spring who really talked about the idea of practicing using a tool for high stakes, letting them have a practice before you give them the actual high stakes exam. So if students have never taken a quiz before on in Canvas, one of the things I do is I have a quiz in my orientation and it's a really easy quiz and it's a low stakes quiz. And I'm doing it really so, not as much so that I see that they've gotten the right, the right answers, but so that they have an opportunity to practice the tool. And a lot of my orientation, in addition to wanting to be welcoming, that's one of the main points. But the other main point of my orientation is to get students to practice the tools, the main tools that we're going to be using in class in a low stakes way so that when we actually get to the content that matters, that they have already practiced the tool and the cognitive, that they are not cognitively overloaded. Another thing to think about for equitable assessment is considering having the first high stakes, and I put writing project because I'm English, but whatever the high stakes project is, consider making it full credit for having followed the parameters. And this depends on what, what you're teaching as well, but you know how that might look for your discipline. But what I do for my discipline is early on, I have a really short essay and as long as they have followed the parameters, they get full credit. And I really focus in on giving them the feedback of my expectations of what I'm trying to see in the next high stakes project. And that way it sort of takes the anxiety level lower and gives them an opportunity to practice without having to worry about being perfect. And I'm able to give just in time support uh, give an, another tip for assessment is give students an opportunity to assess their own work. Again, this is something that Lynn is doing in her class as well, where she has students turn in her high stakes assignments and also use the rubric for assessment. I have uh, created a couple for my own classes. So I, depending on the project, I have students actually focus in on one thing for that particular assessment, which allows for reflection and actually helps students go back and look at their work metacognitively and be able to make choices for themselves and gives them agency. Lynn, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Because I know you do this regularly. Um, which part? I, I'm, st I'm struggling, Janet. I'm trying to find the presentation and I cannot find it anywhere. I've checked in shared with me. Okay, I've, I I, did you change the title? I, I can't find it. Nowhere. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry, you guys. No, and no, then no. I will answer that question. Okay. You know, why don't you answer that question while I make 
Well, I put the link in there. I don't know why I didn't just do that. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Can you repeat the question really quickly? Yes. The question is, I was talking about, um, I was talking about giving students an opportunity to assess their own work, and I was saying yes. that I do it regularly. Do you want to add a little bit? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I decided in 2019, like uh, fall of 2019, I think it was, even maybe in the summer um, prior to that semester, that I wanted my students to have more agency in what it was that they turned in. So I developed a self-evaluation tool. And with every assignment, every formative, I mean the summative assignment, the major assignments, only this is only on the major assignments, they will turn in a... Um, a self-evaluation and in the self-evaluation I have the rubric for the assignment and they need to give themselves a score in the rubric you know above average average or still emerging and they have to give a rationale for why they gave that score including pointing out where in the piece that they've turned in that they have met that goal and then there are some overview questions at the end what is your overall score and why do you um, why do you think you deserve that score? And it was fascinating the first time I did it because my students tended to um, underestimate how well they did on an assignment. I think they're so used to getting um, scores that they don't think that they deserve that they put themselves uh, as deserving scores lower than what they did. I mean, we're talking objective scoring patterns here with a rubric that says, I mean, you know, as objective as a rubric can be <laughs> um, because they're subjective, honestly, let's be honest. So uh, once they did it a few times, they really started to value their own work and they could see where they could improve. And then I would respond by commenting on their self-evaluations on places where they could improve if we disagreed on the score. But nine times out of 10, we were in pretty good agreement. They know where they can improve. And right. they make choices on what it is that they want to submit. So in a, in, a, in a course where they're writing papers and turning in papers, this works amazingly. But I can see it being adaptable for any kind of course, particularly in a STEM model where um, uh, students, and, and I don't know if this is true, I'm just talking based on what I'm hearing from my, my children, um, if they don't follow a certain pattern to get the answer, it's wrong. But in an, in an evaluation like this, if they can rationalize and justify why it is that they got the answer they did and it fits in the sound pedagogy, then they should get credit for that. So I think it can be adapted in that way, but you all would tell us because, you know, we're in a liberal arts discipline. So, um, but it is a super valuable tool and it gives students some um, involvement in their overall score. Yes. And I I, I, long, sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to take a real just, and I, I want to try and finish the ones that I want to talk about really quickly, but I want to show you guys something really quickly because I, I received a lot of requests here and I want to show you something that I show students. When I, I gave you, um, I gave you an option to take a look at this. What you do to make a copy of it for yourself is to go to file and hit make a copy. And once you make a copy, it becomes yours and you can edit it all day long. I will share with you that every single underline here is something that you can go and link in and find other links as well. So you can open it up and find those links, but I just wanted to remind you how you can make your own copy and keep it. And I do it all the time. When I am taking Lynn's materials, she, you know, she'll send me her slides. And then I, the first thing I do is I hit make a copy and then I put Lynn's particular um, assignment. I do that all the time. Well, I'll be doing that on your presentations from now on so that they show up <laughs> in my drive. Yeah, so they I show up so in your drive. sorry, y'all. So, but anyway, so that's what I do. But I want to go back here and talk about a few of these, and then I want to get to our group activity. I wanted to talk about cheating, and I wanted to take a moment to talk about it because it is a really hot topic, and there are times where I'm like, I, I get so frustrated that people assume that students cheat, and then I get very frustrated when I find students cheating. So I am one of those people, and we, we don't have to discuss it all here, 
In our discipline, uh, we are given the option to use this tool called Turnitin so that we can check whether students are cheating or not. I do not use Turnitin at all because I find that in, in my pedagogical belief, I think that it requires students to turn in papers and if they write a paper for my class and then they go and take Lynn's class and turn in a piece of their paper, maybe the prompts are very similar and they can take what they learned before and move it forward and they use it in her class, it shows that they have, uh, and, she, and she uses Turnitin, I'm not saying Lynn does, but I'm saying if she did, it would show that uh, the students are plagiarizing their own writing and I don't like that and that's enough for me not to use the tool. At the same time, I also have found my stuff all over the internet, all of my assignments. My friend has gone, oh my God, all your assignments are in this one place. And it makes me so mad. And so one of the things that I have done to sort of combine this idea of trying to encourage students not to cheat, but at the same time, not expecting, not assuming that students are cheaters. I hate that. I, I hate that attitude that students are the enemies and that they're cheaters. I'm trying to figure out how I can be a better teacher to engage my students so they don't feel the need to cheat and try to guide them so they, that they're not cheating on accident because sometimes that's the case as well. So I have a self-assessment revision, uh, revision reflection journal. It's a big mouthful, but every single word is important. And I require them to keep a journal of, you know, every single part of the process of writing their paper and it's an ongoing journal. And what the journal is asking them to do is to really reflect on their own writing. And I figure that if students have taken the time to purchase a paper from somebody else, that they have to do this self-assessment revision reflection journal. And one of the, the things that I do is I require this. I tell them, and I, I'm very straightforward, this is my, kind of my one hard area where I say, if you, in order to get a grade on your final writing project, you must turn this re, uh, revision reflection journal in because it is that important. It's that much a part of the process. So I'm really, that's kind of my hard line in my class, my, my single hard line there. And, but this is a way for, to get them to reflect instead of assuming that they're all going to be cheaters. And to me, I really think it's important to reflect on your own learning and thinking and teaching as well. All right. Um, those tools, just really quick, both of those tools that you um, just noted are, um, are real authentic learning types of tools. And they're the types of things that we as professionals do as well. We'll sit down and we'll journal and we'll talk about with ourselves in our own way, what is working in our teaching, what is not working in our teaching. And, and to get students into that practice is a great way to get them to understand that learning is a process and that they never stop. They will always um, get better. And if they can do something where they are, are able to reflect on and see their learning, they might value your content better than if they were just being evaluated on what they could report out to you, if right. that makes sense. And I am going to just do one more because I think, I, and I'm going to stop, but you can, there's, the list is long. You can keep going. There's actually even more things here that I was planning on talking about, but this is the last one I'm going to talk about for now so we can work together. So the other is um, an idea for a redo or a revision. So Angela Hop Nagao came up with a sample redo form for testing based on grading for equity that she has for her class, which actually could be easily used in STEM classes and other classes. And I took her form and I actually ended up having to radically change it for what I wanted it to do because I'm not doing a whole lot of exams. And I created a writing revision project. And so this is an opportunity for students who have not met the SLOs of your rubric, who are working really hard to have an opportunity to go back and redo. But what I like about it, and I'm gonna open up Angela's instead of mine. What I like about it is that it's not just simply saying, yeah, anyone can redo at any time. It's actually walking students through 
thinking about what they could have done differently to prepare for the exam, as well as to understand the material. So she has this wonderful test retake uh, form, and she has to, which asks about the concepts and chapters they had problems, what asking the students what they're going to do about it in the future, as well as meeting with the instructor to try, sorry, that went through quickly, meeting with the instructor to um, arrange a time to retake the test. But there's a lot of steps that students have to take because it's really having them go back, look at their work, look at the, their behavior that created that work, look at what is not understand, un understood that the professor could help them understand, and then they're ready to retake it and hopefully be more successful. All right. Lynn, do you have the Google Doc, the Google Doc link? Oh, I couldn't hear you. Sorry, you're on mute. That's because I'm muted. So sorry. That um, collaborative Google Doc is in the chat. I am going to put it down here at the bottom again. Thank you. Uh, it is there. Okay. So I want to share that there's also some more thoughts on equitable grading practices by Angela here, linked here. But now I would like to go to the sample, um, the Google Doc. Sorry, I went, oh yes, the Assessment Collaborative Google Doc, which I also have open. So if you could please open that up. I think it's right here, nope. I had it opened, but now I've lost it. Here we go. There we are. So if you could open this up, this is an assessment questionnaire. And I would like to give you maybe four minutes, five minutes tops, where you can write down as quickly as you can, and it does not have to be complete sentences, nobody cares about grammar capitalization, and there's some ideas here that you can talk about. Assessment problems and solutions. I'm gonna just stay at the top, Zoom takes too long. Canvas questions about quizzes, assignments, gradebook, and answers, what about the late policy? Instead of traditional testing, I do this instead. And how do I do traditional testing in an online format? And I'm gonna give you about five minutes to write in this, and you can write more after our session is over. And I'm gonna come back and write some responses if there are some responses that are needed. And then we're gonna go into breakout session, a, break, a quick breakout session for about seven or eight minutes, okay? So I'm gonna move back though to the,